Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to my show, Looking to the East, our twice monthly review of what's going on in Asia. We have a very special program that we do periodically uh, with uh, two of my friends and two um, related people to my university, Kansai Gaida University. Um, we'll be covering a number of economic and political issues in the show. So if you're looking for a perspective on what's going on in Japan in particular and how Japanese people are looking back at the United States, uh, please stay tuned for the duration of the show. I want to introduce to you our guest today. First guest is uh, in Paris, France. So it's quite late in the evening for him. It's Dr. Paul Scott. And uh, I know Paul from his previous engagement at Kansai Gaida University. He's also a professor. Uh, in Europe right now. So, Paul, thank you so much for joining the show. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Always. And then we have a graduate <clears throat> from Kansai Gaida University Asian Studies program, as, as I was uh, as a student, undergraduate student, Jiri Mistecki. And Jiri is a partner at Kitahama Partners Law Firm in Osaka, which is one of the major firms in the Osaka area and uh, frankly, a success story when it comes to uh, graduates from Kansai Gaida University. Jiri, thank you so much for also joining today. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. Great. <clears throat> so we have a number of items, uh, topics that we discussed in advance of the show. Uh, the first one is uh, just in general, what is your perspective? And maybe I'd start with you, Paul, because obviously you spent many years in Japan and following Japanese politics, but now, uh, for the last few years, you've been living in Europe and uh, looking at uh, Japan from that perspective. So we have a Prime Minister Kishida, and uh, recently we had the unfortunate event of the former Prime Minister Abe being assassinated, which uh, really impacted the Japanese public and also Japanese politics. Kishida seems to be buffeted by a number of different issues as a result of the popularity of his cabinet and also of him has remained quite low. So Paul, what is your view or your assessment of the struggles of the Kishida administration? And then maybe if you don't mind looking into the crystal ball, do you, do you think he'll survive? Um, I'm not sure if it's the struggles of the, of, uh, of the individual prime minister Kishida or actually the struggles of uh, the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, which has always, uh, despite its, its stewardship over the Japanese economy almost nonstop since 1955, uh, has always been plagued by, uh, by corruption, uh, has always been plagued uh, nonstop by scandal. And um, uh, the popularity of of uh, Japanese prime ministers has has rarely been uh, high. I mean, he started off high, uh, sort of sixty three percent, and now uh, uh, down to forty. Uh, you know, Japan has. I used to when I taught at Kansai Gai, I taught a course on Japanese politics, and I asked uh, if anyone could name uh, uh, the the the, um, the prime ministers of the last year, where I think there were about six. You know, they don't, they get an A for the class and oh my goodness, <laughs> uh, one student almost got all six of them. Um, uh, so, so, so the problem is, is, um, is the problem of a challenge of Japanese democracy. I mean, usually, and I don't want to say it's, it's normal to have a, a politics of alteration. We have a party in power and then one out of power and, you know, Republicans and Democrats, which is normal. Um, it's a one-party democracy. Um, the opposition mm -hmm. is weak. Uh, only 97 um, um, seats in the uh, in the lower house. Uh, the LDP still has 261 from the last election. Mm -hmm. So, despite the fact that they're corrupt, um, it is uh, the inability of the opposition to to mount a successful uh, campaign. Uh, so, Kishida. You know, could come and go, and there could be someone else and someone else. We could have a repeat to uh, a couple of uh, Japanese prime ministers uh, in the next couple of years. Yeah. So, if he was to be replaced, then given the strength of the Liberal Democratic Party, 
in the Congress or the Diet, that it would probably be internal power struggles that would potentially take him out and have someone else replace him, I would say. That's what's so interesting. And I want, uh, you know, Jiddy uh, to, uh, to uh, come in on this, that even in a, in a very strong one party, if you want to call it very strong uh, majority party democracy, there usually is debate. You could say that there's democracy within the, within the party. Exactly, Stephen, what you're talking about. I don't see that. Hmm. Okay. Me, I don't see that in, in, in Japan. I see a very, um, uh, a very conservative, you know, seniority based, uh, party. Uh, and there's not going to be, uh, an Obama type figure. And I'm, you know, very positive towards, uh, towards uh, the former president and senator from actually challenging his own party. Amazing. Uh, absolutely amazing that he could win the election, the nomination, excuse me. Um, um, so I don't see that happening within the LDP. So um, uh, self-reforming. I mean, Kashida has cleaned out his cabinet uh, in part and, and purged it. Uh, but um, uh, you can even say, you know, can put in more women, but, you know, they're very conservative, very status quo. Uh, uh, women, so gender really doesn't make much of a difference there. Um, mm -hmm. Although it's nice to see as a photo opportunity, right? Yeah, Jerry, what what do you think? You're in Japan. You're reading about this every day. Sure. Well, you know, uh, of course, we've been, you know, rocked here in Japan by a, a recent uh, assassination of uh, a former Prime Minister Abe. Um, you know. Uh, his, if we sort of take a historical perspective, you know, I, I would disagree. There, there have been uh, a few uh, actually strong, very popular uh, Japanese prime ministers. Nakasone was one of those. Koizumi was one of those. You could argue Abe uh, was one of those. Of course, all in the LDP. I would agree, of course, that the LDP is is basically, you know, the ruling party. Uh, of Japan, and while there have, through the years, been certain other parties which have exercised some sort of, you know, uh, uh, counter pressure, it hasn't really, uh, you know, uh, changed Japanese politics to a multi-party democracy. I would, I would totally agree with that. Now, back to the assassination, however, you know, I've, um, right after the uh, uh, assassination, you know, I live in Nara, uh, which is where the assassination of uh, former Prime Minister Abe occurred. My, my son actually goes by Saidaiji Station, where it occurred uh, every day to go to school. Uh, it, it was shocking. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people at the time felt that, oh, well, this is sort of a JFK moment from an American perspective anyway. This is sort of a JFK <laughs> moment, you know, for Japan. Um, I don't, living here and, and seeing things as they're unfolding. I don't necessarily think that's gonna be the case. Actually, historically, uh, if you look at, at Japan, uh, it's been a while, 86 years uh, precisely, but in the 20s and 30s, you had acting as well as former prime ministers assassinated um, you know, through uh, political violence, primarily right wing and the ultranationalist movement that happened back then. So political mm -hmm. violence, uh, <laughs> while certainly shocking, I, I think certainly to modern sensibilities and the way it was done it is not something that's going to fundamentally uh, change the, the country. Um, what is interesting is going forward, you know, the relationship between uh, the LDP and, and, you know, various elements, again, the Unification Church, which was, right. you know, the, the, the part of, you know, the, the reasoning uh, at least according to the assassin for the assassination of former Prime Minister Abe. Um, so, you know, w w as, as far as the future, we'll, we'll sort of see how, see how it goes. But I would agree that the LDP, uh, if there is going to be any, any sort of uh, change in Japanese politics or direction, it's going to be internal. It will be as a result of an internal struggle within the LDP. Yeah, so uh, one of the uh, observations uh, that I made, and I, I saw in other locations as well, after the assassination, that Abe, despite being in the former prime minister <clears throat> you know, camp, he, he was no longer directly in power, still controlled the largest faction of mm -hmm. the <clears throat> Occidental Party, the LDP Party, right. and was somewhat 
uh, putting brakes or, or influencing Kishida's policy. So even though he was not in the forefront, he certainly had tremendous power. But now he's gone. So that creates a kind of internal tension on who will lead that particular faction and how whoever that new leader is uh, will influence the Kishida agenda, which Abe and Kishida did do or did have different uh, agendas in terms of how they looked at Japan. Abe is considered to be more conservative, more nationalistic to some extent. Kishida, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah, I, I, look, I, it, it seems that Kishida, when he came in, had essentially uh, three major things to deal with. It was the COVID crisis and the planned reopening of Japan. It was the economy, of course, with the rising prices, falling in, uh, and the geopolitical uh, issues around Taiwan and, and various other things. Unfortunately, he doesn't, you know, whatever faction uh, he, he may be from, I, I don't think the public perception is that he has handled any of these areas particularly well. Mm. Um, and, and again, that's actually, that's not just, I, I think, the internal uh, or domestic view, but internationally, uh, I think as well, particularly with regard to COVID and the reopening of Japan or the non-reopening of Japan. Yeah, right. All right. That provides an interesting, uh, a nice segue. Thank you, Jerry, for helping me out in my role here as moderator to our next no topic. Yeah, and that, that is this incredible depreciation of the yen over the last six or seven months. Uh, so before the show, we uh, talked about the dollar yen rate being $1, one US dollar to 143 yen, whereas within a year it was down in the one, what, 108, 105 range? That's right. So it's been a 30, 35% depreciation, which makes me feel poor, guys. I, I don't <laughs> want to the take yeah. the end base salary and put it in the dollars, you know, maybe I yeah. should be applying for a government aid. Um, you know, it, it, that's a joke because obviously it doesn't really affect prices in Japan, as far as I can tell, maybe other than uh, like the price of, of gasoline. But on the flip side, <clears throat> from the external perspective, Japan is now on sale. Uh, the euro, the dollar goes so much further than it did, you know, just within six to 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan hasn't fully opened to international tourism, but I'm sure as soon as they do, people are going to get their calculators out and go, Japan is now cheap. So anyway, Paul, how is this being interpreted or how are you how viewing are you? it uh, from, oh, from Paris? I, I know you're planning a trip to Japan and it's now 30% cheaper than it was you know, six months ago. So for you personally, this is a bonus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is... This is uh, 1985 uh, all over again, or even 1945 all over again, where uh, the Americans set uh, the yen dollar exchange rate at 360. Uh, all stories about why they did 360, because it's a circle and 360 degrees, but of course, to make Japanese exports cheaper, uh, never ever thinking that Japan would develop uh, competitive products. Uh, and then that gets into a job uh, that becomes in that becomes the political problem uh, of trade uh, trade imbalances and maybe even a type of beggar thy neighbor. Um, you know, everyone wants uh, uh, a currency advantage. So this this will eventually, and the Bank of Japan will have to intervene, I think, um, and uh, to um, to uh, stop this uh, and reverse yeah. part. Of it. Uh, so this is a political. This is becomes. It always becomes a political problem. Uh, exactly, you know, Toyota's making a fortune. Um, uh, every one yen difference uh, translates in uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of profit. And it's exactly what you're saying, uh, Steve, that, you know, by, you know, sitting on my backside and, you know, uh, you know going to sleep and waking up the, uh, the, the next day, suddenly I'm 10% richer. <laughs> or four, and I did nothing uh, to do that. And that's, again, back to 1985 with the Plaza of Courts. And, uh, you know, people, there's advantages and disadvantages for Japan and, of course, for the international community as well. Um, uh, mm -hmm. So the, for, the, for the yen uh, to be at its present value is, again, to repeat myself, uh, is a political problem. And an, it's all political economy. 
Um, of course. Yeah, right. these are, it's all interrelated. And yeah. the, the primary reason I've read that this is occurring is that the Fed in the United States, in order to defeat inflation, has raised interest rates significantly and is continuing to do so. And the Bank of Japan has done nothing. Has, done, has not raised interest rates at all. So you have this huge interest rate differential between the US rates and the Bank of Japan. <clears throat> so clearly, Paul, you're right. This is a political issue. Ajiri, I know you were very passionate about this when we were discussing this. Right, well, no, look, I, I think the, 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 the reasoning uh, and why this is happening is, is, is exactly as you say, and I think most economic analysts agree, it's, it's the mover toward higher interest rates in the United States. So, well, why does that create it? Well, that because investors, you know, who exactly. want to invest, for example, in bonds, they'll get much higher return on their investment with higher interest rates, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll be investing more in U.S. nominated or dollar denominated assets, which creates, you know, the the uh, Im imbalance, and and therefore you have the you know the dollar, you know, relatively strong despite inflation in the United States, whereas the yen compared to dollar is, is, is just plummeting. The problem is that, um, as you said also, Steve, the federal, uh, well, in, in response to the Federal Reserve's uh, 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 interest hikes, the Bank of Japan has, it's not that they've done nothing, they've decided not <laughs> to, to raise, oh, to so raise interest a, rates. They still, want to keep, they still want to keep interest rates at their current levels. And, you know, that that is it's going to be kind of a risky game because the Fed in the United States has, you know, signaled that they're going to continue to raise uh, interest rates. And so if if the Bank of Japan's response is to, again, make the decision not to raise rates in Japan, well, then, you know, it seems that the 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 currency gap is going to get even wider. Yeah, that's my and, question to and you guys. So, you know, if if that happens, look. It again, as 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 Professor uh, Scott said, um, it's good and bad. Record corporate profits in Japan. Uh, that's not necessarily filtered down, you know, to uh, employee salaries and things like that. But you know, mm -hmm. um, Japanese companies and at least in exports are doing quite well. Um, the question is, at what point do you go beyond, you know, th that threshold where it it, you, the, the yen dollar imbalance is so great that it actually starts to hurt, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Japanese economy. We'll see, um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm sure that, that the, you know, only time will tell, but it, it, it is something that at least those of us who are living in Japan and seeing our, uh, you know, the, the value of, of, of our money, uh, you know, sort of go down the drain, it's becoming quite concerning. And also... So you know, what Go ahead, market, Paul. Yeah, I'm sorry to, uh, you know, but what do markets and risk analysis hate more than anything? It's uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have too much uncertainty. I mean, COVID, you know, the COVID recovery uh, uh, was not as fast as people felt and there's higher, in, higher inflation rates. That was not predicted. Uh, but then you add in uh, Ukraine, there's, how is that going to end? And I don't have a clue on how that's going to end. Uh, there's so many different scenarios, from nightmare to uh, uh, to something a little less uh, than nightmare uh, ending. Uh, it could be very positive as well. Um, uh, to Taiwan, um, and uh, Taiwan is not uh, dealing with 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 Russia. Uh, there's so much interdependency there, um, and. Um, um, you know, I lived in Taiwan for three years. I work for the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. Uh, I'm very uh, uh, more than sympathetic. Taiwan is a democracy and uh, incredibly successful. They are also the largest chip manufacturer in the world. And uh, we know that some countries like India are hedging their bets, so to speak, and trying to produce uh, chips just in case there's disruption. Uh, but there's... Um, too much uncertainty and exactly what Judy is talking about as an investor where, where's the safe haven on this and yeah, uh, yeah that, that's, that's an interesting point Paul and, and also thank you for uh, as Jerry did transitioning us to the end yeah I thought that was pretty <laughs> uh, clever <laughs> yeah you know I can turn my mic off you guys are yeah we, we're getting better at this quickly. yeah 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, but uh, that that's a very interesting uh, perspective. Jerry mentioned there were three challenges for Kushida. This is obviously the third one. And um, I, although Japan will make statements and try and take a leadership role when it comes to the uh, international politics within the Asia region, and certainly I think America is encouraging Japan to be um, more proactive about it. I, I, I don't know that Japan's actually made any progress towards establishing a clear perspective on Taiwan and so forth. So, and also uh, we were running a little bit out of time here, but I'd like you guys to think about this in terms of what's actually happening in Ukraine. <clears throat> when the invasion first occurred, and actually on shows that we did together, we all thought that, oh, now China's gonna watch that and Russia wiping out Ukraine will encourage them to potentially be more aggressive towards Taiwan. But the news as of the last, what, two to three weeks is that Ukraine is actually kicking Russia out. So it's turning, it's looking like, and many are predicting that Russia is going to lose this war. So, Jerry, I know you're very passionate about this as well. So what do you think? That yeah, the fact you that know, Ukraine is doing so well. Does that discourage China, do you think? Uh, it, it, look, it, I, I, I think it very well may. Uh, I, I, and I think that is, you know, certainly a uh, uh, very positive development you know, and, and, and letting authoritarians know around the world that, you know, uh, they, they can lose and they can be put in jeopardy by alliances of, of, of democratic countries. The, the issue, I think, uh, or maybe the difference is probably a better way, is, is that the situation in Europe is not the same as the situation in East Asia. Uh, I think, uh, particularly, I think a lot of Western, if you look, look at a lot of Western news sources, they often very much like to compare uh, Taiwan and Ukraine as sort of the same sort of thing. Look, there are some similarities, but there are also some huge differences. Um, there in here, and this is where Japan's, you know, Japan is in a, in a, in a rather difficult position, both political, militarily, vis-a-vis uh, -vis <laughs> Taiwan. There, there is no, uh, you know, EU uh, equivalent in in East Asia, there is no NATO equivalent in East Asia. Mm -hmm. So um, countries in East Asia like Japan, like South Korea, uh, who you know, may have very strong uh, worries and objections uh, regarding Taiwan uh, are a, a bit more hamstrung and rely much more on you know, powers like the United States um, to, to deal with this, whereas uh, there's more of a collective response uh, in Europe in the Ukraine crisis. Yeah. Paul, do you, do you agree with that? Is, is that I agree, the absolutely. And you do? Okay, also, great. You know, the Americans, uh, the U.S. Congress and the American people are willing uh, to send billions. And uh, uh, France and Germany uh, are not sending a, a, a lot of, uh, uh, are nowhere near uh, matching uh, uh, the American commitment, uh, Great Britain, or the UK commitment. Yeah, um, and as far as you know, I just you know have these figures off the top of my head. But as far as you know, percentage of GNP that uh, that the, even the US is uh, is spending to uh, to support Ukraine is you know point twenty four percent. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not even a, it's about a quarter of a percent of GDP. It's not that much money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we could send more. Um, and exactly, you know, whether well, what uh, Mr. Putin's uh, response uh, uh, would be to uh, to a military loss, and you know, um, uh, to put this over to Taiwan. How do you say no to an authoritarian? I mean, how do you give an authoritarian bad news? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this is the great advantage of a democracy, and that's where China sees our disputes. And I'm being really forceful here, as as a weakness, and it's absolutely a strength. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever I think about the Republicans uh, uh, and and all of that Fox News stuff, you know, fabulous, good. Um, there's dissent. Uh, there's uh, uh, alternative opinions. There's criticism. Um, how do you do that with Xi Jinping? So the danger in China is, uh, uh, you know, you have to be very careful of believing your own propaganda. And uh, who's going to dissuade him from thinking that he can do this 
mm -hmm. uh, and persuade him, be careful of having a war with the United States. We're not weak. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, I'm not a warmonger, please. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, you know, don't, don't, but don't test us. Um, and uh, the nightmare scenario is American and Chinese um, um, uh, soldiers and sailors are killing each other. And how mm. does that stop? Mm. Um, I, I don't know. know. I don't know. Um, uh, sinking an American aircraft carrier or damaging one, uh, 6,000 mm -hmm. men and women on those. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, do you con how do you contain that? And there's no detente. Even during the worst days of the Cold War, um, we were speaking to the Russians or the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, and um, it's very dangerous now uh, because we're demonizing. And where's the dialogue? And so I don't like the mood in the United States so much in the Congress from both parties. Uh, where is this leading? Um, mm. uh, I'm not talking about Ukraine because also there should be discussions about about exits and how does this end and what are our goals. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's been enough uh, talk there, but for Taiwan, um, President Biden just on Saturday said he's he's going to defend Taiwan and and bring in the U.S. military. The White House walked that back, but he said it explicitly twice, and he said it before. So how does China read this? Who's in charge? Um, um, of U.S. foreign policy, it's always the president. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, we're unfortunately out of time, but that last last comment that you made, Paul, who is this guy who's our president now? I'm not used to this. Is this uh, some kind of character change that's occurred with him, or maybe he has a, the freedom now to be more direct in terms of how he's communicating to Putin? Certainly, that's no longer nuanced. He's just saying, you know, don't do anything stupid. And now he's telling China that as well. So maybe a topic for us to discuss in a future show. Well, that would be a great topic. Yes. Yeah. Certainly so, would. Towards 2024. Yes. All right. Well, we'll do that, guys. And thank you so much for participating today. As usual, the time has flown by. Um, regarding the issue that Jiri mentioned briefly, the relationship between the unification or Muni Church and the Abe uh, Jiminto, his party, and the many, many members of the party who also had relationships with this church. This is still a major political issue and one of the issues that's dragging down the uh, Kishida and Jiminto party. And it is a topic that I'll be covering in two weeks on this show with Michael Penn, who was a journalist who actually broke the story that this mysterious church that was related to Abe and was the motivation for the assassination was the Unification Church. He was the first person to actually publish that. So that'll be in a couple of weeks. So that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Paul and Jerry, for participating in this uh, show. Thank you. Really appreciate your sure. perspectives. Thank you for the viewers for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you guys in a couple of weeks. So that's a wrap for now. Okay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.